Alrighty, well, praise God. All right, well, I'm going to bring a message tonight uh, that I will just tell you I had a lot of trouble <laughs> this week. You would think, boy, there's just so many things to pick from to, to speak about, uh, but not so much in the age that we live in. So, uh, tonight I am going to talk about a woman, truth in the age of lunacy. And we will start off with this. Let's pray. Eternal God, noiselessly we bow before your throne of grace as we leave behind the politically and socially clamorous year of 2020. We gather now in this consequential chamber to inaugurate another chapter in our roller coaster representative government. The members of this august body acknowledge your sacred supremacy and, therefore, confess that without your favor and forbearance, we enter this new year relying dangerously on our own fallible nature. God, at a moment when many believe that the bright light of democracy is beginning to dim, empower us with an extra dose of commitment to its principles. May we of the 117th Congress refuel the lamp of liberty so brimful that generations unborn will witness its undying flame. And may we model community healing, control our tribal tendencies, and quicken our spirit that we may feel thy priestly presence even in moments of heightened disagreement. May we so feel your presence that our service here may not be soiled by any utterances or acts unworthy of this high office. Insert in our spirit a light so bright that we can see ourselves in our politics as we really are, soiled by selfishness, perverted by prejudice, and inveigled by ideology. Now may the God who created the world and everything in it bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace. Peace in our families, peace across this land, and dare I ask, O Lord, peace even in this chamber, now and evermore. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. Amen and a woman. Oh. Oh my word. So, if you didn't quite catch the end of that, a lot of that sounded very reasonable. And then he lifted up the monotheistic God, he lifted up Brahman, he closed with a men and a women. And when called to task for having done this, he said, well, I was just making a joke, kind of. Only, no, he wasn't, right? So, because I, I know, you guys know me, the Hebrew and the Greek are near and dear to my heart, so let's just go through exactly what it is that that says. We have in the Hebrew, amen, or amin depending on how you want to say it. In the Greek, and that, that means truly, verily, so be it, let it be. Now, the Greek, it gets a little bit more difficult because they transliterated it. So it's identical in the Greek, and you would say amin in the Greek, as you would say in the Hebrew. And in fact, in the Latin, you would also say, because it's transliterated, amin. And in the English, you would also say amin. Now, those of us that come from the South might say it a little bit differently. And after the late 1500s, they shifted from amin to 
amen, which is more near and dear to my heart. But you could say it either way. But in no form or fashion is this related to anything having to do with gender. And to insert that into it, uh, for an individual who is a Methodist pastor of more than 12 years, it's a little odd. It's a little odd indeed. And the problem is, of course, that, that it may have been tongue-in-cheek. You can accept him at his word that maybe that was it. But I would just back you up a couple of statements. Here is a Methodist minister who is praying to Brahma. And about the best he could utter for Christ is monotheistic. Don't really understand how we get there. Other than we have to understand that, that truth is under attack. Remember that, that Christ himself is the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Each of those statements are statements for the concept of living Torah, that which extends outside of time. It is the concept of God himself, because God is truth. Yeshua is truth. They are echad. They are one and the same. And we find that not just in Torah, not just in the Tanakh, but we find that in the Brit Hadashah as well, in the New Testament as well. And you, you, you step away from truth at your own peril. Because even little steps away from that which is true can be deadly. I would point out to you that and we've talked about this, this concept of living Torah stretches across not just the, the concept of, of the living word, the logos, but it's, it stretches across the concept of salvation as well. Right? Christ is that truth. The death and the resurrection of Christ, that truth that was, was hidden from the time that the foundations of the earth were laid but were revealed at just the right time when Christ was to go to the, his death and then resurrect. That's our justification. And we are justified by the truth. You are not and will never be justified by a lie. It just doesn't work that way. Well, justification in the past tense is spoken of. You were justified, it tells us in the Brit you are being saved, or you were saved, you are being saved. And this brings us into this concept of the bilateral covenant. And it's here that God says, if in Shema you will Shema to the voice of Adonai your God, then I will. And really what he wants us to do is to, to incline our hearts and our ears towards him, to listen intently to what it is that he has us to do, and then to make a considered response. Our God is not the God of obedience. He is the God of considered responses. Right? You can't get love from somebody that you're, you're forcing to do something. And our God is the God of love. The way that approach unto God that God has made to take us from where we are, dead in our sins, to alive in Christ, and then to sanctify us, to conform us more and more into the image of Christ. That's what the way is about. That's what the way of righteousness, the way of Adonai, the way of Yeshua. Remember, he says that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And ultimately, we look forth to the last of these, to the life, the life everlasting, right? To the glorification. We were saved past tense, with the death and resurrection of Yeshua, we are being saved by the Holy Spirit through the sanctification process. And when Christ himself returns, we will be saved. We will have glorified bodies. And then we will be saved 
throughout eternity. But salvation is a past, present, and a future event. And you cannot step out of any one of these and still be on the path that God has provided. All of these, right, the truth, the way, the life, these are all Yeshua. These are all Torah. And all of them, you have to be stepping into what it is that God has said to do. Well, the ways of the Antichrist are the ways of lies. Right? And we've talked many times about the various ways in which he works. There's different Gospels. You have Halakha, salvation by works. You have hyper-Calvinism, which is really a deistic way. Wind up the clock, God walks away, and doesn't matter what you're going to do, everything's just predetermined. Well, Scripture doesn't support hyper-Calvinism. But neither does Scripture support polysoterological Arminianism or any other form of Arminianism. And that's hard because we live here in America where Arminianism is the, the primary way that people understand the gospel, or I should say misunderstand the gospel. Pelagianism, Christ is the good example, but nothing more, not God, but just a guy who you know, figured out the way to, to do it. We should do it the way he did it. Everything will be great. Right? These things are all lies, right? The earliest attacks, the earliest heresies were attacks on Christ himself. He wasn't really a man. He wasn't really God. He didn't really die. He was not the Messiah. He never existed. He just fainted on the cross and they took him down and rescued him and never died. It's just amazing the stories that come out. Today we're, we're dealing with these other two categories where we have a different God, Brahma, that monotheistic thing, and Brahma is not monotheistic. Remember that the Hindus are polytheistic. Okay? What, what uh, I don't know whether to call him Reverend Cleaver, all I can think is when I, when I say Emmanuel Cleaver, I think, yep, you sure cleaved Emmanuel, all right? God with us, you had just cleaved it right in half. Um, what he put together there was this concept that really, you know, no matter what God you have, it's okay. You can worship your God in your way. We can worship our God in our way. And really, it doesn't matter because there really is either no God at all, and this is all just make to do about nothing, or really God is all of these things. But God cannot simultaneously be truth and lie. He does not change. He's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. And he will never change. But this idea that, that you know, the God of Islam, the God of, of the Hindus, the God of shamanism, people making themselves into their own gods and elevating man to that role, that somehow, just because I think it, it happens and it will be true. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have today this attack on truth. This, this idea that, you know, really, there, there's no absolute truth, so you really can't know what truth is. So, you know, my truth, your truth, they're, they're both relative and they're both equally valid, right? If you, if you think that you can pass through walls, it will not allow you to walk through them, no matter how much you believe that you can. Just like if you think you can fly and you go to the top of the Empire State Building, I can guarantee you that when you step off, you will take the route of gravity, wherever the wind currents lead you, and eventually you will be meeting the pavement. We have evolution, this concept that has, has arisen from the, the 1800s, the late 1800s, and really this was the, the first big decoupling that we had from theism. Oh, well now we have another explanation for why we're all here, so we don't need God anymore. We can just decouple God right out of that and just send him off to the place that everybody mostly wanted him to go but they didn't have a, a logical rationale that they thought that they could, could lay that out and do. 
If you think evolution is logical, come talk to me, right? But I will just tell you, out of nothing, nothing comes, right? There is no way that things go from less complex to more complex continually without somebody doing something in it, right? Some sort of designer, some sort of, of intervention. It just doesn't naturally get as complex as it is. And there's no amount of, of, let's just roll the dice again. If we just keep rolling the dice throughout eternity, eventually we're going to get, get the, the magical chimpanzee that appears. Doesn't work that way. We have this concept of scientificism, uh, practical science decoupled from God. And I would just say that our medical issues that we are seeing now are one of the prime examples of this. Do as we tell you to do or we will make it difficult on you. Do not bring to us other things from other places that may be working because we don't want to hear it. We want you to do what we want you to do. We, we don't want you to buy and wear masks, at least not for a couple months. And then now we didn't want everybody to wear masks. Herd immunity, 60%. Well, maybe 70%. Oh, wait, no, it's going to be 80%. Nope, we're not going to have herd immunity until 90%. And the fact that we have somebody who is in charge of the medical show for the United States who literally says, yep, told you all a lie, told you all a lie four different times. In fact, more than that, we're just talking about herd immunity because I didn't think you were ready to, to deal with the truth. And he's still in his position. I can tell you right now, if I'm lying to my clients about the health of their dogs, they will fire me in a heartbeat, and they should. But we have this idea now that, that you know what? Us smart people, we got this. Just trust me on, on global warming. Just trust me on medicine. Just trust me on all of these issues because we have these technocrats who can run this so much better than you can. If you just get on board and do what we are asking you to do, life will be good, except that it won't. We have atheists, people who say that no God exists, <coughs> only man. Excuse me. Oops, wrong button. There we go. I like to use the, the rat poison analogy because it just doesn't take much untruth to undo truth, right? Truth is not a spectrum. Well, we go from 100% down to 50% and then maybe we're going to start calling it non-truth. If you have, from God's perspective, and from the biblical perspective, any influx of untruth into truth, you now have untruth, period, end of story. And it doesn't matter how strong you believe it. It doesn't matter how much you want it to be true. If you insert a lie into truth, no matter how small an amount, it still is untruth. You know, we have rat poisons that are 0.005%. That's one part in 20,000, right? That's a pretty tiny amount. Do you realize this, that this is an order of magnitude greater than the death rates for people up until they're about 50s for COVID? An order of magnitude greater. So you're talking about one in 200,000 in that age category for those people who get it, right? And that's not to, to, to minimize the COVID, right? It's a, it's a big issue, right? And we need to, to deal with it, but we need to protect the people that are truly at risk from it and not worry so much about the people who are not. The thing about Satan is that he wants to remove us away from God, right? And those of us that walk with our Lord and Savior, those of us that are in our word, the easiest way that he can do that is to just pigeonhole us away from the word. 
If you are not spending time in the Word, the Word is truth, then you're spending time in this world, and this world is untruth. We should think about that more and spend more time in our Word. And what we end up with is a condition where we slowly but surely have been pulled away from where it is that God would have us be. The scriptures mean less and less to us. And now things in the world start taking hold and hardening our hearts. And that's the way that he always pulls us out. Again, it's just really vitally important that, that you remember that you were saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Right? Salvation, we like to think of it as, oh, it's at the cross. Right? That's my destination, I'm going to get there, I got my salvation, I'm done. Sorry, you're just getting started. And salvation isn't fully affected, fully accomplished until the Christ comes back. And in the meantime, we have to be about the sanctification. And your interface with God is the scriptures. That's where you are able to hear God's word. That's where the Holy Spirit will help you. Right? Remember that God has prepared for each of us works that he prepared before he laid the foundations of the earth. Right? Before anything was was formed he already knew us and had works for us to do he also had a work for his son to do right and that's the gospel the good news is that he paid the price for us that we could not pay well the age we live in is is one in which people just think they can do whatever they want and be whatever they want now don't get me wrong, I fully am committed to helping people to reach the fullness of their potential. But as we look at this, we have this quote from Freddie Mercury, you can be anything you want to be, just turn yourself into anything you think that you could ever be. Right, Freddie Mercury, the, the lead singer for Queen. Top center is a woman from, I believe it was Washington State. She uh, put herself down and claimed to be black. She was embedded <coughs> in the, the uh, black community there and, and within the, the groups that were trying to uh, bring about social changes. But she herself is not black. And she said she felt black. And so she put herself down as black. We have Elizabeth Warren, who put herself down as American Indian. Because, let's face it, you look, one look at those cheekbones and you know she's an American Indian. At least that was her claim. She claims that she never, ever put that down on anything. But when Harvard hired her, they touted the fact that she was an American Indian. And that, that now they had this lawyer who was an American Indian, because really, if I've got my touchstone, if I've got my minority, then that gives me one uppins on those who do not, right? Because it's all about having that. We have people who are called furries, who spend their life in a fantasy world where they are acting out being an animal, or sometimes a cartoon animal. Right? That's their perception of who they are. We have people who modify their, their bodies in ways in, in order to achieve effects and, and visualizations of who it is that they think they are, ignoring who it is that God made them to be. We have this spectrum of, of sexuality now, Right? It, it, it went from binary to three or four to five to six to 10 to 12. And now they say, well, it's just a fluid spectrum in two different directions, both in who you're attracted to and to what, what it is that you think that you are. Right? 
The reality is a little different than that. And that's not to say that there aren't some individuals with some chromosome abnormalities. But let's remember, they are exceedingly rare. Okay? These other people who identify themselves based on what it is that they want to be at that time, and I know individuals that have gone from, from bisexual to homosexual, back to bisexual, back to uh, um, normal relations. And, and it just really just depends on how they feel about it. And, and again, if we truly can affect our reality according to how we feel, well, today I feel X, Y, Z. The question becomes whether or not that truly is reflective of reality. Again, if you think that you can fly and you walk off the top of the Empire State Building, you will find out very quickly whether you fly or whether you do not. And we live in an age where our politicians, not only do they, do they revel in the fact that as society gets more and more fractured into us and them, that they will just use that. Our president-elect said that if you're voting for Trump, you ain't black. Guess his reality gets to trump your reality as to, to whether you are or whether you aren't. Right? And the problem will become that invariably realities don't hang out in a bubble. They interact with each other. And now what do you do with that? What do you do when, when your 10-year-old daughter wants to go to the bathroom at a department store and there's a 50-year-old man in there that, that identifies as female? Don't know. These are tough questions. Mahatma Gandhi, nobody in this world possesses absolute truth. Well, that's an absolute statement. I guess he's in trouble already. This is God's attribute alone. I wouldn't argue with that. Relative truth is all we know. Therefore, we can only follow the truth as we see it. Such pursuit of truth cannot lead anyone astray. Really? Talk to the folks that drank the Kool-Aid with Jim Jones. Talk to the people that burned in Waco. You want to talk about a little bit of truth, relative truth, taking you to places that you never intended to be. Talk to, to the vast majority of people who are being sexually abused because somebody convinced them that they needed to leave the safety of their family and they're carved out like a little antelope on the Serengeti Plain to be used. Such pursuit of truth cannot lead anyone astray. Oh, my word. Supposed to, be, supposed to be such a brilliant guy. Well, this is one of Satan's great lies. There are no moral absolutes. Really, you can do anything you want. Did God really say, don't do this? Why would you listen to him? Look, you got all those people over there that are doing it. You should go do it too. And misery loves company, and they will help you to do so. The problem is that it eats at the soul. And individuals who are, are living the lie that they think is a truth, literally, it tears at them physically. Right? And we see that in them. Well, that's okay. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. And if you happen to get in my way, we can do a little gaslighting to get around that. Now, gaslighting is this concept that, that people will, will try to manipulate your understanding of reality by just blustering through you, getting you to a point to where you just question what you're really experiencing. And they do that in a lot of different ways. Their actions don't match their words. They distract from their behaviors by projecting them onto you. Well, I didn't do this, you did it. I know you're doing that, 
right? These are all ways of gaslighting. Degrading comments followed by positive reinforcements, telling you you're wrong, crazy, that you're imagining things. They lie, they deny things, even when there is proof, they will look at you bold-facedly and lie about it and have no qualms whatsoever. They attempt to block or are unsupportive of your growth. In fact, I would say generally the people who do gaslighting are not interested in anybody else's growth, only their own, and they're actually usually interested in the death of those that they're dealing with. They want to suck them dry like a tick sucks the blood from a hound. Well, what does it sound like? Oh, you're overreacting. You need help. I didn't do that. You're upset over nothing. You must be confused again. Now just calm down. Oh, you're just so dramatic. I never said that. Why are you so defensive? What are you talking about? It's your fault. You twist things. Stop imagining things. What are you talking about? You're so sensitive. I never said that. Oh, I was just joking. That's the one I really like because we've heard so much of that one here in the, the recent few months, right? Remember back when Kamala Harris and Joe Biden were both attempting to, to get the nomination to be president? And Kamala Harris says, I believe Tara Reid. I think that you're a rapist. I think that you did it. She said it on national TV. And then when confronted about it, after she accepted the position to be vice president, she laughed, oh, that's just so funny. That's just a debate, you know, come on. You know, I didn't really mean that. It was just something to say to try to get elected, right? Well, if you do that to your own, what will you do to the people that you hate, right? We should consider that when we elect our officials. I was just joking. You're twisting things. What are you so defensive about? You're so sensitive about this. Like, you know, I believe her, but you know, what difference does it make? It's not like a bunch of people died in Benghazi. Well, we have this statement that Joe Biden made, and I want to point out to you that it has been fact-checked by factcheck.org, right? Very effective group. They're always fact-checking to make sure that they understand what things are true and what things are not true. And the statement that, that he made was, we have put together the most extensive and inclusive voter fraud organization in the history of American politics. But don't worry, he, he was fact-checked on it, right? And what they said was, their quick take was, well, the social media post shared by Eric Trump, who basically took that and put it on screen and put it out on Twitter, and Fox News hosts, take a quote by the Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden out of context. To claim that he admits to voter fraud, Biden was actually describing his efforts at preventing voter fraud and suppression. So they, they cleared it up really well for us. And again, it has been fact chess. So anybody who thinks that something of that nature has occurred should just let it drop and walk away from it because it has been fact checked. Don't worry about it. Those folks took care of it. We really need to come to a place to where we understand that truth matters intrinsically. If we do not require it in our families, if we do not require it in our relationships, if we do not require it in our workplace, if we do not require it of our political appointees, we are truly in a terrible, terrible place. Right? The ethics of Google in the post-truth era, they've decided that really truth is just this malleable thing that you can do with whatever you please. And you can make it, my truth is different than your truth, but the louder of us, the one with the bigger bullhorn, the one that gets to repeat it most often, is the one that will be able to put their truth across. And that will become other people's truths, right? Back in 2019 and 2018, they showed that, that by ordering what news you could see, they could shift people's choices politically by 20 percentage points before they recognized 
that they had been shifted. And even after people recognized that, the, that the, the news that they were getting was being shifted, it still was enough to shift it in excess of 20 points, even though they recognized it. It didn't make any difference. We have Facebook, who has graciously opted to, to donate monies so that, that the voters could be well served in the, the communities that they were well served. $500 million, right? Just so that, that, that everybody was gonna get a fair shake. The only problem was that in Facebook and with Twitter and with Google, if you were not in the party that they cared for, you didn't get any help. In fact, you might have gotten less than that. Right? The truth doesn't matter to Facebook. It doesn't matter to the news medias. They will tell you all kinds of things. It doesn't matter to Twitter. It doesn't matter to Google. It doesn't matter to Antifa. It doesn't matter to most of these groups that are progressives. That image that is there is the Fabian Socialists. Their idea of how it is that they will remake the world is to put the world on an anvil after having heated it up and to beat it into submission into the form that they want it to be. Truth matters. And we're in an age where we will all have to choose what battles we, we pitch, which battles we walk away from. We have groups that are, that are calling for retribution against their political opponents and against the people who, who worked for them, making statements like they want to make sure that these people never work again. Sounds a lot like the, the gulags that they had in the Soviet Union. Yet, these are the people that are now assuming the reins of, of power. What we need to do as Christians is to remember that, that we don't get involved in those things. You, you, other than you're going to have to pick and choose your battles. But we serve one that is truth. And we are required to be obedient to he who is truth. And that may be exceedingly more difficult in the days ahead. It may mean that, that individuals are not going to, to have the work that they once had. It's, it's, I will not tell you that these are, are issues without consequences. But we still are called to be that light unto the world. And you cannot be a light unto the world if you're mixing your light with something that extinguishes it. And even the smallest amount of untruth extinguishes that light.